I want to share with you from Matthew's Gospel. This is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had told him, had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Well, if you were here in church last week, or if you watched this me the message on YouTube, uh, from last week and we're paying close attention then you'll realize that this same passage is the one that John Graham started his sermon with uh, last week and John reminded us in his message from verse 23 that God is with us. Matthew is telling us here that a prophetic sign was being fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. Verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that is what was happening here. Mary, who was a virgin at the time, became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And then nine months later, gave birth to a son and they called him. No, wait a minute. They didn't call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. They called him what the angel had told Joseph to call him in verse 21. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So I'm going to talk about why that is a bit later on in this message, why the prophecy said he would be called Emmanuel, but he was named Jesus. But firstly, I just want to bring some encouragement to those of us who are perhaps a little bit like Joseph. I wonder if you picked up on what was happening to Joseph here when I read through the passage. Um, we see events unfolding, we see Joseph's response and we learn something about his character. He's conscientious, he seems to be quite sensitive and caring and as with a lot of caring and sensitive people he wants to do the right thing but is probably quite anxious about it. Can any of you relate to that? Are any of you like that? Or do you know anyone like that? Well I think I'm a little bit like that. Joseph was engaged to be married to Mary and he found out that she was pregnant now. Listen to how conscientious he was. In verse 19, it says, Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. He was committed to doing what was right. Now listen as well to how loving and kind he was um, as we continue on in verse 19. Yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So he planned to do something which was both conscientious, obeying the law, and at the same time was loving and kind, protecting Mary from being humiliated. So his plan was this. The end of verse 19, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph was a conscientious man, a kind man, a loving man, who came up with a good plan. But then the angel of the Lord intervened and spoke to him in a dream and we find out that God had a better plan a plan which Joseph had been afraid to choose in Joseph's desire to do what's right he'd been afraid to take this path he could have decided to stay with Mary and bear her disgrace with her but he'd been afraid to do that with the limited knowledge he had at the time about Mary's pregnancy that would have meant breaking the law it would have also been a decision which would have meant he was riding roughshod over the cultural norms of the time. He'd considered his options and he'd come up with what looked like the best 
good, right and caring solution. But God's plan was much more risky and it required a step of faith. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Well, often one of the first things angels say when they reveal themselves to humans is, do not be afraid. And that's because they display something of the awesome majesty and splendor and holy presence of Almighty God. And our natural response in that presence is to fall flat on our faces on the floor, trembling. But when this angel tells Joseph not to be afraid, it's not because of that. It's because of um, his fear of marrying Mary. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What Joseph had discovered about Mary had filled him with anxiety and fear. Now the angel was challenging him to face that fear and to step into God's plan for his life. Joseph had feared disgrace for himself and for Mary, but God's plan was to honour them in the most amazing way possible, for them to be the human parents of Jesus God's son, the saviour of the world. Now, aren't we just a little bit like Joseph, ordinary people who desperately want to get things right, people who want to do what's loving and caring and kind? Aren't we those who get into a right twisted mess when we faced with situations where something seems to have gone wrong and whatever we choose could upset someone in the process? Aren't we just the kind of people who get a twisted knot in our stomach sometimes because we're so eager to make the right choices for everyone else and because we want to avoid looking bad and being publicly disgraced? Yes, I'm like that. As I said, I'm a little bit like Joseph. And when we feel like that, don't we then try to make a good plan, the best plan we can to follow the rules and get things right, but also to avoid hurting people as much as we possibly can. And then don't we sometimes hear God's voice breaking through, challenging us to face our fears, to embrace faith and to see what his will is in those situations? Doesn't he show us that the challenges that have come our way haven't come to ruin us or disgrace us or humiliate us, but are rather a means of helping us to draw nearer to him so that he can lift us up and honour us in some special way. Isn't that what happened to Joseph? And isn't that what Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then reading on in Jeremiah 29, verses 12 and 13 tell us that when we pray, God will hear us. When we seek God, we will find him if we seek him with all our hearts. And then verse 14, God says, I'll gather you up and set you free from your captivity and bring you back home to a place of safety. You see, the dreadful things that our hearts expect are not what God's planned for us. They're not his ultimate plan for our lives. We can make a plan like Joseph, a careful plan, a loving plan, a kind plan. But if that plan is coming out of a fearful place, if it's a fearful response and it's not born out of faith, then it's not going to be the plan that God has for us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. And Proverbs 5, sorry, Proverbs 3 Verses five to six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Our best thinking is nothing when compared to God's wisdom. We need to learn to listen to the voice of the Lord, talk to him, listen to him, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to have an expectation that he's always present and at work in our lives. God's alternative plans don't mean that we should break the law or take actions that are unkind or unloving. Joseph Joseph was given insight by the angel that assured him that he would not be breaking the law because Mary was in fact still a virgin. And the action he was called on to take 
would be even more loving and kind than the one he'd planned. Taking Mary in, protecting her, caring for her, providing for her, making her his wife. He would probably be greatly misunderstood and face some kind of kickback from his actions, but Joseph was being called on to trust God and to obey God's higher law, the law of sacrificial love. So the angel said to Joseph, verse 21, she, that's Mary, will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then at the end of the passage, we read Joseph that we read. Joseph abandoned his carefully formulated plan and faced his fears and embraced the way of faith and did all that the angel had told him to do. Verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he didn't consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. You see, it's not just Mary who humbly obeyed, but with Joseph, we see a little bit more of this kind of inner struggle that can take place in us sometimes when we need to get to the place where we can make a faith filled, God inspired choice in our lives. So the angel told Joseph to call the child Jesus, and that's what he did. But Matthew tells us here that. The prophecy that's been fulfilled is the one that clearly relates to the Virgin Mary being pregnant and giving birth to a son. And that prophecy says that he should be called Emmanuel. And so to understand that, firstly, we need to zoom out a little bit and realize that God is given many names in the Bible and that they complement rather than contradict each other. In the Old Testament, God reveals his personal name to Moses, Yahweh, which means I am. That is an eternal I am. I am in the past. I am in the present. I am in the future. That's his personal name. But he also has numerous titles, names which describe his character and his nature. Some contain the word El, a general word for God or a God. For example, Elah. Literally an oak, meaning the dependable one. Similar to that, Eloah, the adorable or worshipful one. Or El Shaddai, the almighty or sufficient one. Or some titles contain the word Jehovah or the shortened firm form of Jehovah, Jah or Yah. Which was a way of expressing Yahweh without actually writing or saying it because that personal name was considered so holy. So, for example, we have Jehovah Hosenu, the Lord our Maker. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our Provider. Jehovah Rafi, the Lord our Healer. And God is also portrayed in images expressing his character, which we can relate to, such as Father, Shepherd and King. And there are so many names or titles of God in the Old Testament and he is all of those things but he's revealed this one personal name in the Old Testament Yahweh and in the New Testament this same God comes near to us he's born as one of us and he is all those things listed in the Old Testament and in that sense he is Emmanuel God all the things that God is with us and in later life, Jesus makes it clear that he that he is in very nature, not only man, but also God. He takes that name Yahweh, I am, for himself. Well, I recently preached through the seven I am, am statements of Jesus that are listed in John's Gospel. One of those is, I am the good shepherd, which uses not only that personal name of God, I am, but also one of the Old Testament titles of God together in one phrase, the good shepherd. The Jews wanted to stone Jesus because of the divine claims that he made. In the verses we read from Matthew's Gospel, there are three names or titles for Jesus. In verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Messiah or Christ means anointed one, the promised one who would bring in the kingdom of God, the one who was prophesied about. A few, a few verses on, we read that word, Emmanuel, God with us. And of course, then we have the name Jesus. 
verse 21, you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is both a personal name of God, the Son, but also a functional title. The name Jesus tells us how it's possible for God to be Emmanuel, for God to be with us through him. That's why Emmanuel and Jesus are both together in these verses so closely together. One is dependent on the other. It's all well and good us proclaiming that God is with us. Many religious people do that. Some get their religious fervor all muddled up with nationalism and or with uh, terrible causes. Some are involved in terrible acts of violence, proclaiming that they're doing it because God is with them. We can proclaim or pronounce that God is with us as much as we like till we're blue in our face, but it is only true if we firstly embraced Jesus as the one who saves us from our sins. For God to come close to us, for him to be truly with us, not just as something uh, of a name or a claim, not just as a label for our cause, but something which is actually true in reality for us. Jesus has to be our saviour. And that's why these two titles are right next to each other here in these verses. Jesus came so that we could know God with us, Emmanuel. And he made that possible by being Jesus, the one who saves us from our sins. That's the only way God could be with us, through Jesus dying on the cross to save us from our sins. Genesis 3 tells us of the fall of mankind, the original sin which separated mankind from God. After Adam and Eve's sin, God came into the garden looking for them and he asked two questions. Where are you and what have you done? Because of their sin, the beautifully close, wonderful relationship they enjoyed with God had been broken. Contaminated by sin, they could no longer walk in harmony with a holy God. And Jesus came to restore that broken relationship that all of us have inherited from Adam and Eve. The one who saves came to save us from our sins and from the eternal consequences of those sins. He gave his life on the cross so that we could be forgiven, cleansed and reconciled to an almighty holy God so that we could walk in close fellowship with him again. That's how we can know God as Emmanuel, as God with us, truly with us, truly close to us in an eternal, bonded, loving relationship with him. God asked the first Adam, where are you and what have you done? If God asked, God the Father asked the second Adam, Jesus, the same question, what would he say? Where are you? Jesus said, here I am. I've come to do your will. It's written about me in a scroll. And what have you done? I've given my life as a sacrifice for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And if God asks you today, where are you and what have you done? Will you be hiding away like Adam and Eve, knowing that you've sinned? Or will you be able to confidently say, I'm here in fellowship with you, my God, my Emmanuel, because I've received Jesus as the saviour from my sins. Joseph was a conscientious man, a loving man, a kind man, a man who made careful plans for his life. But God had a higher, greater and more loving plan for him. And that required him, that plan required him to take a step of faith and to embrace the coming of Jesus as saviour into his life. It's just the same for every one of us, for you and for me. However good, however loving, however kind we're trying to be, we need to let go of all our self-sufficiency, of our personal striving to do what's right and what's best, and we need to take a leap or a step of faith to receive Jesus as our saviour and to walk with him as our Lord every day, enjoying the beautiful presence of Emmanuel, God with us, listening to his voice, trusting in his wisdom and his guidance and choosing to walk in the more loving ways that he sets before us.